Good morning, and welcome to the Open NEX seminar series. And today we have a really exciting presentation by Dr. Rasmus Hoburg uh, from uh, South Dakota State University. Uh, Rasmus has done some um, really uh, interesting work with the CubeSats. You know, as many of you may know, uh, the CubeSats were uh, some of the, the original contributions of uh, NASA Ames, you know. Uh, the previous director at NASA Ames, Pete Warden, started the small sat facility here. And uh, some of the guys left you know, NASA and started the Planet Labs in, uh, in San Francisco. And uh, so Rasmus is actually working with, the, with a lot of the data. And uh, I think probably your work is, uh, is one of the, uh, the most uh, up-to-date in terms of uh, what can be done with, with CubeSats. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so I really think it is an exciting time to be in Earth observation, um, in part due to this new paradigm of applied conservations of CubeSats. So they now have hundreds of these small satellites in space. It's really kind of uh, overcoming the traditional or classical trade-off you have between spatial and temporal resolution. So it's giving you daily coverage at three minute resolution globally. <coughs> it, it is really as put by as eloquently put by Freddie Mercury, it's a kind of magic. Who would have, have imagined this for just a few years ago? So this talk is about realizing the full um, potential of this novel resource. So I'd like to show you just to give you kind of an uh, an idea of the progress and the advances that have been made in Earth observation over the years. I won't go into any real detail but just to show you kind of where we are at. Uh, there's been tremendous advances made in, in Earth observation at from medium to very high spatial resolution. Uh, Landsat is a, is a key example of this, providing a very long-term invaluable record of surface change and characteristics. Um, and still, there's an ever-increasing ever demand for enhanced spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, and up till recently, uh, this could only be met the expensive tasking of commercial systems as a world, as a world view, and even then on an, on an area, area limited basis. Yeah, so we kind of entered the era of the CubeSat, um, and it, it's defined as a, it's, it's both, it's based on a kind of a standardized model of building block design, um, that has a single unit size of 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters and a mass less than 1.3 Kilograms, that's kind of the specification. Uh, and the concept is to uh, launch flocks of these small satellites, satellites that, that are constructed from cheap commercial off the shelf components. And, and the significantly reduced cost compared to conventional system really makes this feasible to do and economically uh, viable. Um, and then you can configure these in a number of compatible sizes, including 3U, 6U, and 12U sizes to kind of expand upon your application potential uh, and use it for a variety of different purposes. And this is really kind of a rapidly growing field uh, as I think it is on the path to kind of reshape Earth observation as we know it. And I see a huge potential uh, for enhancing space monitoring with this, this new resource. So Planet uh, Labs is the is kind of the biggest operator of, of these small satellites in space. They have currently around 175 active uh, nano satellites that adopt the, the 3U standard. It has a mass of around four kilograms, and this massive constellation is is orbiting or is kind of imaging the entire globe in uh, in four bands: the RGB and near infrared, at a three to four meter ground sampling distance. And most of these are in, in a sun synchronous orbit with a fairly consistent orbit past time. Uh, and the key, the key advances of this is the spatial <coughs> enhancement compared to Landsat and, and Sentinel, for instance. For instance, you, have, you go from 30 meter for Lanza to 20 meter, 10 meter sometimes for Sentinel, down to three meters for, for the CubeSat, for the famous CubeSats. It's really quite useful in order to better resolve interfield dynamics, uh, such as shown here. At the same time, uh, uh, CubeSat systems overcome 
the trade-off that you typically have between spatial and temporal resolution of single sensor and satellite missions. So for every Landsat acquisition, within those you have you can have up to four Sentinel acquisitions, shown in the second panel, then up to 16 CubeSat acquisitions, sometimes even more, as you might have more than one acquisition a day. And this is this kind of uh, observation frequency is similar to the realistic capability you get with a MODIS, with a two satellite MODIS configuration, but with an impressive factor of 80 to 160 increase in spatial resolution. So this is really quite a huge advancement in terms of resolution. But it does come with our limitations. Uh, this is a multi-center configuration as you're going to have cross-center inconsistencies both in terms of uh, the geolocation, you can have shifts sometimes, as, as illustrated in this diagram. Uh, this is based on fairly old cubes, uh, planet CubeSat data, where I experienced a shift up to, I think, 19 meter on, on a few cases. But uh, looking at some of the more recent data, they seem to have corrected that quite, quite nicely, so often I don't see a shift with more than one to two pixels. Then you have the spectral resolution is not comparable to that you get from conventional systems such as Landsat and Sentinel. Uh, the bandwidths are significantly broader in the visible domain and they also have significant overlap compared to Landsat and Sentinel. Uh, and that's going to introduce some cross sensor inconsistencies. Um, this shows you the temporal uh, the, the spectral response of a, of a selection of CubeSat sensors. This is the average response of 16 CubeSat sensors compared to that of Landsat, and you can see it's quite different. The shading kind of gives you an idea of the variations between the sensors. In addition, you also have uh, the radiometric quality is not comparable to that of Landsat and Sentinel-2, which will introduce cross-sensor inconsistencies and cross-calibration challenges that you need to consider. So this just kind of shows you uh, that spectral metrics, common met a common metric such as the NDVI is not comparable, and consistent across the different sensors. Uh, the CubeSat NDVI here is significantly lower than the Sentinel and Landsat counterparts, even after the atmosphere correction. So this is something that you need to consider, and it's gonna, call, it's gonna result in some interoperability issues if you wanna produce a combined uh, good time series. So I've, I've been developing this, this methodology, it's called the CubeSat Enable Spatial Temporal Enhancement Method to kind of uh, improve the quality and utility of the CubeSat data uh, by, by a key feature it, it, it is that it exploits these conventional data streams, including MODIS, Landsat, and Sentinel, uh, to calibrate the CubeSat record. Um, to kind of to bring it into place. Uh, and it's a, it's a multi-purpose tool. Uh, it can be used for radiometric normalization. It can also be used to reconstruct the phenological time series using NDVI. And it can be used to spatial temporal enhancement of bio biophysical properties. And this, this production of high level uh, products is, 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 is quite important as I see it, as it gives you these quantitative insights and in many cases, it's more important for end users. I won't go into any, go into any great detail about the methodology, but just, just briefly show you the inputs. So you have MODIS and, and Landsat surface reflectances, and then you have your CubeSat data. It can be in digital numbers, it can be in top of atmosphere reflectance, or even surface reflectances. The specific format doesn't really matter for this methodology, so you can use any input format that you like. And then the Landsat or Sentinel that I'll show later will be then used as a reference and that will be used to correct your CubeSat data into Landsat consistent estimates. So it's a bit of a elaborate process. Basically, it uses uh, MODIS data that has been downscaled uh, to 30 meter resolution based on the CubeSat data to kind of quantify. The changes in your surface reflectance between CubeSat and Landsat acquisitions, and this information is then used to to identify and sample spatially distributed reference data from a selection of past Landsat images. And this information is then used. So you do that for each scene. So you 
we get a reference image for each scene that is used to construct a model based on a machine learning approach to kind of convert your raw CubeSat data into landsat consistent estimates. And that can then be translated into a time series of NDVI that is consistent in time. And this is also being extended to, to map biophysical properties, such as leaf index, also incorporating Sentinel-2 data. And this methodology is, is described in a recent paper in remote sensing. It will take me an hour to explain this, so I'll just don't give it here. Uh, so I'll just focus on the results, uh, looking at a number of evaluation sites, including um, a site in, in Saudi Arabia, where I did a lot of work, irrigated agriculture. Then we have a site in the Corn Belt in Meade, Nebraska, and then one in your own backyard, Southern California, Imperial County, close to the Salton Sea. So these, this is the uh, results on the utility of system for radiometric and normalization over the site in Saudi Arabia. In this particular area, you do have an eight-day landsat visit because of, because of all that being uh, swords. So it gives you a bit higher frequency, uh, frequency than you normally do with Lancer. Uh, the frequency distribution can show you a comparison of the raw CubeSat NDVI data and your Lancer NDVI. The CubeSat data is based, what I show is based both on top of atmosphere and, and 6S corrected data. And you do see quite a significant shift compared to Lancer. Also when you look at the density scale plots, there's, there's big discrepancies on this specific day, uh, even after the atmospheric correction, you do have a significant underestimation and a, and a mean absolute difference of around 25%. But it varies widely from day to day. So this is just one day. And then when I apply the system methodology, the NDVI data, you see the histogram, it matches quite nicely. The bias is largely eliminated, and you get a, a mean absolute deviation of around 2%. So it, it serves as a mechanism to kind of bring it into place. It's not just a bias uh, reduction, but it also kind of space and the space of the domain corrects for the differences. And you can apply this to the individual bands as well, as, as shown here, blue, green, red, and near infrared. Uh, and this is an independent validation against between the assessment corrected surface reflectance estimates. And the, and the Landsat, they coincident Landsat estimates showing an error of around 1%. So it really shows you that using this methodology, you can produce daily Landsat aid consistent imagery from the CubeSat data, uh, yeah, with a factor of 10 degrees in spatial resolution and then with a metric quality that's quite comparable to what you will get with actual Landsat observations. So uh, now I'll talk a bit about phenology reconstruction using these uh, system-produced NDVI time series or the site in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this gives you a bit of an insight into the frequency of observations of the CubeSat data. You can see after, this is for 2017, and the frequency kind of starts to, to get better around there, we 155. Again, pretty dense, these are only clear sky observations. And I think in about 9% of the, of the time, the, the gap between acquisitions is less than three days. And if, you, if I look at 2018, it's going to be even better. So it's quite impressive. You also see that the overpass time is, is quite consistent, around 9.45 in the morning. You have a few outliers, and it's mostly from, from those sensors that are in, a, in the uh, International Space Station orbit. You have a few that, 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 that still operate in that orbit that will result in significant wider range in all past times. And the view angle is also quite constrained. Uh, in most cases, less than four degrees from Nadia. So these are the results. Uh, as this, this is a six month period uh, for a multi alfalfa field. Uh, I plotted both the CubeSat data, the PS planoscope CubeSat data, based on top of atmosphere surface reflectance, as well as the system corrected data. So you see, you know, there's a lot of noise in the raw data, uh, the black, and, and the, 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 the black uh, kind of time series. Uh, but after applying system, you kind of bring it into place, you, 
get a much better, a more Landsat consistent estimate of the NDVI, um, and you get a better kind of sense of the phenology, is able to reconstruct the phenology that you would expect for both alpha, and you can better be able to kind of determine the exact timing of phenological transition, such as harvesting, which otherwise is quite difficult. Um, and I'm going to do a, like a fast forward animation of showing the CubeStat data before and after system correction. You also get a sense of kind of the noise in the original data and the utility of system for correcting that using a more consistent and reliable uh, time series. Kind of jumps up and down on the, on the, right, on the left. Uh, yeah, this also shows kind of this phenomenon too. So the middle one is the CubeSat data, just one day apart. So it's completely red, it's very green, dense, and then the next day is much less dense. So this is not a realistic thing, it's just, just noise in the data. And with the system data, you're able to correct for that noise, so you get almost the same kind of uh, signal as you would expect between these two days in two days, uh, and it's consistent with your Landsat estimate. So the Landsat, they guys to verify that this is, that one is not real, this is real. So, so this is just another side, this is the, the maize, the corn side in, in Nebraska. Um, so just one growing cycle, but still if you use only have Landsat data, as the red circles, you're gonna, you're gonna miss a long period because of cloud cover. So, and again, you see noise in the, in the raw CubeSat data, it kind of jumps up and down. And with system, you can kind of correct for that and use a more sensible, meaningful time series. And you can also kind of get an appreciation of the enhanced spatial resolution that you get from Landsat to, to the CubeSat data. So you can kind of infer much more in terms of interfield variability with this kind of data set. So it has also been applied to session two data, as shown here, using that as a reference instead of Landsat data. Um, with session two, you have more clear observations, as you can see, but you still have significant data gaps. Um, so this is in the start of the growing season. It's a 20-day gap, and again, uh, during senescence, as a 30-day gap. So you really need the CubeSat data to kind of uh, track and monitor what is going on between those periods. Uh, so that, that's really, really important to have that kind of information. And then again, there's also a spatial enhancement going from 20 meter to, to three meter. Uh, just a few slides on cloud protection because that's an issue in the planoscope, in the CubeSat data as well. And system does include techniques to kind of detect, uh, detect clouds and, and cloud shadows. Just show a few examples based on a fairly simple uh, object-based feature recognition and classification approach. Uh, but it does a fairly good job, but that's, that's something you need to really take care of um, to find a correct ball if you want to use good time series at this scale. In some cases, uh, it, it won't detect the clouds, but it still has a mechanism to kind of attempt to reconstruct what's going on beneath the clouds. This is still work in progress, but you can kind of see a little thing about it does kind of reconstruct some of the features that you would expect below the clouds. But that's, uh, yeah, there was some data fusion uh, that I won't go into detail with, but this is this is work in progress. Uh, also shown here, <coughs> a cloud, shadow, trying to reconstruct it. It's not perfect, but you know, much better than that one. Uh, yeah. So uh, for this one, Let's go back to the phenology a bit. Um, this is an overlay of the Sentinel and the Landsat based system results. Just kind of evaluate how consistent they are. And there seems to be a quite good intersense of consistency, both uh, temporally and, and spatially, with these two results. Uh, you, you will expect some differences because of the small spectral differences between Landsat and Sentinel. Uh, and ideally, rather than kind of doing two separate runs with Landsat and Sentinel, I think in the future, I will just try to ingest like a harmonized Sentinel Landsat uh, data set that has been corrected for VIDF and spectral differences. 
So this is the uh, site in Imperial County. Um, an eight, eight month period of data, uh, alfalfa, which is called alfalfa. Again, so Landsat alone simply cannot monitor these rapid growing cycles. It's gonna miss a lot of things. Um, but it's useful as a reference to kind of bring your CubeSat data into place and co correct for this uh, small frequency noise that you do see in the data set. Uh, but this really shows the value of having daily data. You can actually reproduce this kind of phenology. Uh, and again, you have the raw uncorrected data on your left and your corrected system corrected data on the right. It kind of gives you an idea, again, of the noise in the CubeSat data. And just similar site, but for Sentinel-2 data, uh, just showing uh, an animation of one growing cycle. Again, demonstrating the spatial and temporal enhancement that you get with the, with the CubeSat data, even when you have a fairly good Sentinel-2 uh, observational record. And here I'm just kind of, again, into comparing the two estimates. There's a fairly good consistency. Early in the season, it seems that the Sentinel-2 base was also a bit better as it has more observation to kind of constrain the retrievals and the reproduction, the system-based reproductions, but in general, you have a good consistency, also spatially. But, but still, you know, even when you have Landsat and Sentinel data combined, you're gonna have weak periods in time where you have fairly significant gaps, in particular for a crop like this, you know, you're gonna miss a whole lot of dynamics uh, that you really need daily data to kind of resolve. So, um, system has also been used for for the production of biophysical uh, parameters like leaf or index at the spatial temporal resolution of the of the CubeSat data. Uh, and I'm going to show a few results in relation to that uh, based on both Landsat and Sentinel-2 data. It's described in this paper in remote sensing. Uh, so this shows just uh, how good the reproduction is. Of, of, so the top one is your Landsat LAI that is used as a reference, and then the below plot is the, your CubeSat LAI that has been reproduced using a machine learning approach. So based on the, the your four bands, spectral bands in your CubeSat data, you can quite accurately reproduce your your Landsat-based LAI using using a random forest uh, implementation. Uh, I think the mean absolute deviation is around 5% in this case. Uh, this is the, just for one scene, but this is done for, done for each scene, each CubeSat tile. So you need, you need to build up a specific model for each tile. Uh, and, and then you show just for one point, you, you kind of see the, the LAI progression here of your CubeSat LAI. It provides close to daily information on, on your LAI dynamics, and it's um, and it kind of tracks the, the features and uh, it kind of matches what, what you get from Landsat when you have a Landsat acquisition. But then it adds additional information in between those acquisitions. So this you can see that in the in the below below part, it's like an eight day sequence during a during a very rapid green up period that is bounded uh, with Lantern LAI on, on day 208 and 213. And then you have, you really get an appreciation of what you miss in between those, those Landsat observations. You know, there's a lot of things going on that if you only had Landsat data, you wouldn't be able to tell. So this is a really demonstration of the value of having that kind of information uh, available. Uh, so it also been um, system has also been applied to Sentinel-2 data uh, over the site of Meet Nebraska using a more physically based uh, LAI estimation method. It uses a hybrid random forest implementation of, of full cell, uh, and it really takes benefit of the enhanced spectral 
configuration of the Sentinel sensor compared to Landsat, for instance. It's able to kind of constrain the inversion a bit better. And this shows the Sentinel retrievals in, in red squares over the cornfield. And then you have that are used as a reference in system to kind of spatially and temporally enhance those. And then again, you see good consistency between your CubeSat estimates and Sentinel-2. Um, it won't exactly match Sentinel-2 because it kind of uses a weighted average of, of, of different scenes. So it also kind of takes into account any uncertainty you might have in your Sentinel data as it uses multiple, as it takes data from multiple scenes and uses that as a reference. But you can also kind of get a sense of the spatial differences that you get with these two solutions. Uh, so how, how good are these estimates? So this shows an, a validation of the CubeSat LAI retrievals against in-situ measurements uh, over three cornfields in Nebraska. Um, so the system is able to, in this case, able to quite accurately reproduce your LAI with an R-square of 0.92 and a mean absolute difference of 13.5%. Uh, if you only have Sentinel-2 data, the results are not as good. Because you're gonna miss, you know, you're gonna miss periods in the, in the green up season and the plants in essence where you don't have sufficient uh, temporal coverage to probably match your your in situ measurements. So it's gonna greater diversity, of greater spread in your retrievals. So again, that's a good example of the benefit of having that daily visit. But you really need your good Sentinel two retrievals to kind of constrain it. So it's kind of a synergistic synergistic approach. Um, so, in order to make this useful, it's really important to kind of produce a near real time production stream and uh, in order to, to power smart farming and, and other applications that need this time information for decision support and management uh, purposes. So, so, this is this is not done yet, but I think this is potentially feasible um, and something uh, and, and the methodology is kind of being redesigned in an attempt to kind of facilitate that. So steps that are being undertaken is that you know the, the reference sampling is only being do, been done backwards now, so only looking back in time, so in order to facilitate near real time predictions. In the beginning I was looking both backwards and forward in time in order to get a better uh, kind of a pool of reference data to use. But it can work in this way too. Um, and all, this, all the processing streams are being automated, have been automated for seamless execution. Uh, so another issue is the latency of satellite data acquisitions. <clears throat> I think one day is a bit optimistic, it's probably more like four to two, give and take. But if you move it to the cloud, you, know, you can bring that down even further. The machine learning techniques that are, that are used uh, have been optimized you know, for, for big data analytics, so they're well, well suited to, to be used on the cloud. Uh, but the, a cloud framework will be needed to, to handle these massive amounts of, of, of data if you want to do a large scale uh, operation. Uh, so, in summary, um, system represents a cross platform calibration approach for that you can use for multiple things, including radiometric normalization, uh, phenology reconstruction, as well as higher level biophysical product generation. In, in, this, in this way, you, you can think of this as a synergistic approach towards enhanced uh, sensor interoperability and data harmonization in, in some ways. And a key feature is that it uses data from these gold standard satellites like Sentinel and Landsat and MODIS. Uh, to realize the full potential of these cheap, cheaply designed CubeSat systems that don't have the same quality. Um, I think an, another important thing about the system is that it's, it's sensitive to the degree of cross-sensor inconsistency, so it can work with really noisy data. Uh, you, you, can, you can input the digital numbers or the topographic reflectance, it doesn't really matter that much, as kind of the association is established on a scene-specific basis. And that also means that it can fairly, it, it's, it's adaptable to other sets of platforms. It can be other CubeSat systems, it can be UAVs, it can be something else. 
something that needs calibration in order to produce and deliver meaningful products. Uh, a key feature also is that it goes beyond mere production of spectral data. Uh, if it tastes indices, it also produces higher level products. Uh, I demonstrated LAI here. So, and that's these insights, these small quantitative insights, is, is more valuable for many end users, I think. Uh, and then it gives you, know, it gives you unique spatial temporal insights um, that I see as a game changer in Earth, Earth observation uh, that has application for transform across diverse aspects of Earth observation, uh, with precision act being an obvious one, but there are still a lot of applications that could benefit from this kind of information. Uh, looking a bit ahead, I think uh, in addition to optimizing mapping efficiency and bringing it to the cloud, probably also try to integrate Sentinel and Lancet data in a harmonized manner that will increase the training database, if you like. Uh, I think you can also expand the capacity to other biophysical properties, including leaf chlorophyll. Uh, even in rapid transpiration, I see a potential for that as well. Um, and you can also extend it to other sensor systems, including UAVs. You can even go beyond that and, and, and try and think, you know, how can we combine CubeSats with geostationary platform? You know, bringing, bringing, the, bringing together this hyper temporal resolution geostationary data set with this high, very high spatial and temporal resolution CubeSat data I think that would be a very neat thing to do. It's probably not easy, but I think there's potential for doing that. And I just think if you get diurnal data uh, at three meter resolution, I think on a daily basis, that would, that would really be cool. So there's a lot of things you can do. This is just a few few ideas. Uh, I think it's open to a lot of, I think this is a, it's a nice time to be uh, in remote sensing. There's a lot of things going on and a lot of things you can do. So I think with that, I will conclude and thank you.